Will you welcome with me Mr. The One and Only, Clayton McDonald. Here he is. It just got really hot in here. Is that better? You guys want to see a magic trick? That stinks because I don't know magic. It's my joke for tonight. Do you think we could just bring down the house lights a little bit? Or not. <laughs> it's cool, Joey. Oh, that's perfect. All right, well. There it is. <laughs> I haven't even said anything. You guys are already laughing at me. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to get into it. My name is Clayton McDonald. For those of you um, who haven't heard, and I am 18 years old. But I'm unlike most 18 year olds because most 18 year olds at this point in their time are pursuing a career or a job or pursuing college or mapping out their life, so to speak. And I don't have that luxury because, as Adam said, I am sick with leukemia. Just for those of you guys who, who don't know, um, here's a little recap on my life. Seven years old, we thought it was just the flu. I had fatigue. We thought that was from wrestling. I had bone pain. We thought that was from wrestling and it was flu season. Lo and behold, my mother, being the great mother that she is, realized that something was indeed wrong, so she took me up to Paso to see my local doctor, and he told my mother, I think your son has leukemia. That's blood cancer, cancer of the blood. It's when your bone marrow, the stuff that makes your blood, is infected and just keeps making more bad blood. Seven years old, diagnosed with leukemia. It's supposed to be, this type is supposed to be easy to treat. So we do two and a half years of chemotherapy. I'm seven years old. I just figure every kid goes through something like this in their life. So I just listen to my parents and listen to my doctors, take all my medicines, take the shots, do whatever. Because I just figure this is what always happens to everyone. So I just play with my toys and have a good time. So two and a half years of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is just straight poison that goes in your body and kills everything that's alive. So I guess some guy was like, two and a half years of chemotherapy, that's a good round number. Let's give them that. That should cure them. So two and a half years of chemotherapy. That was I thought it was funny. Two and a half years of chemotherapy. So no more jokes tonight. And then two and a half years of being a real kid a kid that doesn't have all these tubes, a kid that isn't in the hospital, a kid that doesn't have all this medicine. I mean, um, but I do, you know, I have to go up and get checkups and stuff, get blood draws, whatever. Two and a half years of being a real kid. 12 years old, seventh grade, wake up in the middle of the night with this extreme back pain, so bad, pantsing back and forth in my living room, bawling my eyes out, hyperventilating, and my mother is sitting there and she is helpless. I can only imagine what was going through her head because I can't. Four years later, third time, get that same back pain. Get a second bone marrow transplant from my sister this time. First time, second time I got sick, first bone marrow transplant, my brother. Third time I got sick, second bone marrow transplant, my sister. This is when I was 16. Two years later, a little bit short of a month ago, I became extremely anemic. We didn't know why. We go up to my local doctor again. 
He says, hey, you got to go to Twin Cities to get a blood draw. See if you're anemic or not. Go there. Get the blood draw. Extremely anemic. Comes back. Extremely anemic. They say, hey, you need to go up to Stanford and figure out why. So get a bone marrow. Long story short, for a bone marrow, really big needle in your back. Take out the bone marrow. Very painful. Um, basically, anything that's wrong in your blood, they can check that way. So get the bone marrow. This is a little bit short of a month ago. Results come back. This is the fourth time that they've done this. They told my mother, your son has leukemia. Again, I can't imagine what she's had to go through and what she still is going through. She's amazing, my whole family. So, I'm a terminally ill cancer patient. For those of you who don't know what that means, that means the doctors have told me, Clayton, there is nothing medically that we can do for you. So basically what I'm thinking is unless God does a miracle, I am going to die soon. So I, I'm here, terminally ill cancer patient, telling you that life is very, very short. And there are a couple of Bible verses that Adam and I have found that describe this very well. James 4, 13 and 14. Now listen, you who say, to today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? Why is your life, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. So I stand before you tonight, knowing that life is short, knowing full well that life is short, and it is a vapor that is here one second, then gone the next. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Everyone dies. I mean, I know it better than most because the doctors have told me that I'm going to die. Doctors can tell you guys you're going to die and it's still going to be true. They just don't have a window of when that might happen. And I am forced to live my life every day at a time. I think, this is what I believe, that you guys have it easier than I do. No. Scratch that, reverse it. I have it easier than you do. Because you don't know, you don't have a window of when you're going to die. I do. I have that luxury. So I can drop everything and live every day as if I'm going to die. You guys have distractions. You guys can get distracted. You guys have school, work, play, whatever, anything and everything that Satan has you distracted by. And that's why he loves the United States of America because of all the distractions that this country has. And being sick and being terminally, 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 whatever, ill, Um, normally you get a lot of questions. I don't know why, I guess you're dying, let me ask you a question. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> but a couple questions that I realize I get a lot is one, Clayton, do you ever just ask God why? Like why you? Like God, God why me? Yes. Yes, I do. But not 
why me, oh God, poor oh me, why me? Why do I get, why do I have to have cancer? Why do I have to be sick? Why do you put this on me? Why can't you just let me live my life? No, not like that. I ask God, why me, as in, why do you bless me with something like this? Why do you give me something that in the long run has changed so many lives? That's the why I ask. Second question that I normally get asked is, Clayton, are you scared? Every single time I've told them, no, what is there to be afraid of? Blah, blah, blah. But I tell you the truth when I say, I am petrified. I am scared to death. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> I'm petrified. But I'm not scared for the whole cancer thing. I've been doing that for 12 years. Almost two thirds of my life, that's all I can remember is cancer. I mean, I've been, that, I've been on that train forever. So I know what's gonna happen. I know what it feels like. I'm going through it right now. I'm not scared of the whole cancer part. And I'm not scared of dying because I know where I'm going when I die. I know that once I die here, I will spend eternity in heaven with my Lord and Savior because I spoke with my mouth and believed in my heart that Jesus is Lord and I asked him to be a part of my life and I was able to do that because God loved us so much that he sent his only son here on earth to die on the cross for our sins giving us an opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with him but what I am afraid of is everyone who doesn't know where they're going when they die. That's what I'm scared of. That's what, that's what tears me up inside when, when someone is living life and they don't know where they're going when they die. It eats me. We're having a conference in two weeks, high school and junior high. It's called Awaken. And their slogan, their spiel, if you will, is living a life of risk. Living a life of risk. Dun, 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 dun. Um, and that, that's been on my mind, and I can't get it out of my head because when, when you live a life of risk, this is what I've come to understand if you live a life of risk, you live a life apart from God. And this is someone who's been fighting leukemia for 12 years. This is what I'm telling you right now. The safest place you can be is where God wants you. I'm telling you right now, it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be scary, but it is the safest place you can be. I heard a quote once, See if I don't mess this up. Safety isn't the absence of danger, but it's the presence of God. So I'm saying, hey, if you do God's will, you might get bad disease, or you might be sent to Africa, or whatever it is. It might be hard, it might be scary, but I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed, and I guarantee to you, it is the best. And that is coming from a boy who's had leukemia four times. God's will is the best. As I said, I'm, I'm very scared. Scared for you who don't know where you're going when you die. Or maybe those who think you know where you're going when you die and you're trying to earn your way into heaven or do this or that to get into heaven. And that scares me. There is no risk 
when you're in God's will. James 4.15, I purposely didn't read this at the beginning um, because I wanted to save it for now. Listen, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. God's will isn't risky. God's will is the best. All right, um, you guys are up against the walls. Perfect job. I'm going to ask everyone else to stand up. Please. All right. You guys all see me? Probably not, I'm sure. Okay. This is what I want you to do when I say go. I want you to sit down if you know there's something in your life that needs to change before you die because life is so short. I'm going to repeat that. I want you to sit down. When I say go, I want you to sit down. If you know that something in your life needs to change before you die because life is so short. Go. All right, you can sit down if you stay standing. Those of you who uh, were in my little seminar thing uh, about a month ago, you guys are going to know what I'm going to say next. Who cares? I don't care. So what? whoop de doo I don't care. You told me there's something in your life you need to change. Wow. But what really matters, because that doesn't, but what really matters is if you actually do it. You don't just say something and then not, because too many of my friends, too many people I know and love have said they're going to change, but they just don't. So what's really important, what really matters, is if you actually have the courage and have the strength to do it, and you do it. Because whoop de doo maybe, maybe you just stood up because you could be like everyone else, and you sat down because you want to be like everyone else. But almost every single one of you in this room told me that there's something in your life that needs to change before you die. And you don't know when you're going to die. We've already established that. You could die tonight. You can die in 80 years. You and I, only God knows we don't. So make that change. This might hurt, but this is the truth. I am dying. Unless God decides otherwise, he's going to take me home really soon. And people, people ask me, hey, Clayton, how are you doing? And I say, good. Because that good is the best I am that day because every day for the last six weeks slowly inside I have been dying and I have been feeling it and it is so draining 
six weeks. So when you ask me, hey Clayton, how are you doing? And I say, I'm doing as good as I can be, or I'm doing well, or I'm doing good, any of those things, I say that because that is as good as I'm going to ever become. I stand before you today I might not be here. I might not ever talk again or whatever. And guys, you only have one life. And there's only two places you can go after this life. As I said before, I'm very scared. I'm very scared for you guys out, out here in this crowd because I know you're out here who don't know where you're going when, you're, when you die. Or who, or maybe you think when you die, you're just gonna become part of the earth. Or, or the people who think they know where they're going, but they're going about it the wrong way. Look guys, this is all I am. This is, this is who I am. And the life God has given me, this is it. And I love him for it. And through this life, I have grown tremendously, and my family has grown tremendously, and my friends with me have grown tremendously. <coughs> I don't want to leave this earth without doing, without, without trying, without giving it my all. Because I love you guys. I know there's teachers here. I know there's high schoolers here. I know there's some junior hires here. I know there's not just a test girl. Look, this is me. And I'm scared. For most of you. I'm going to ask Adam to come back up. so he can help me with this next part. <laughs> if you have been sitting here listening to me, because earlier most of you guys stood up and said there's something I need to change. And tonight, for some of you, I'm going to give you that chance. We're going to give you that opportunity. We're going to give you a chance of a lifetime. This is me being real. That God... God loves you guys so much and because of that I love you so much and 
this is what I want you guys to do. If, if you have never received Christ, and you want to, and you feel that thing in the back of your heart that's tugging at you, that's asking you, and you're wondering, what am I missing? There's a hole here. If you want to make that step, that huge step of faith, what's on the mind of one kid who knows that life is short. So what you just heard, it's not, it's not some deal from a pastor. It's not some canned deal that somebody came up with to try to talk you into something. It's, it's the wish of a kid who knows he's going to go be with Jesus pretty soon. So what's on his mind is not things that are on your mind and my mind. He voted yesterday, but may not even be here when the new person gets in office. I mean, his life, he knows is like a vapor. And so what he wanted to most communicate tonight, I think he did a fantastic job and a wonderful, wonderful job at, at displaying what's so important to him right now, and that is that each and every single one of us are separated from God from the moment we enter into this world. That Clayton and me and you and every single person here doesn't deserve to be in heaven with God because we are not perfect. The Bible says for all of sin and fallen short of God's glory. But the reason this kid's different, and I don't want to elevate him tonight, it's not about Clayton. When we talk about it, it's not about Clayton. It's about God's story working through Clayton. That while Clayton was still a sinner, that God sent his son Jesus to die for him so that he could be reconciled to God in a relationship that was wrong since birth, that he could enter into that relationship with God. But that's what it's all about. And he knows that there are a lot of people out here who may not believe that. But I'm here to tell you as Clayton's friend and youth pastor for a number of years that those words that he said, that's what he's been telling me for years. Other times he had cancer, he told me the same thing. What I care about, what I care about is where all these people are going to be going. He doesn't want it to be an emotional plea, but it's hard for it not to be because sometimes the thought of death alone brings upon so much emotions in our life. But what Clayton and I want to do right now is give an opportunity for anybody here who's never been reconciled to God and never got on their knees before and said, God... I am messed up and I need Jesus. God, forgive me of my sin and make me clean. If you've never done that before, Clayton and I want to give you that opportunity to do that. Just a moment. Can you guys uh, just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Can I ask you to, if there's anybody here that, just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If, if there's anybody here that's never prayed to receive Christ before, Clayton, can you lead them in a prayer tonight? And inside your heart, you can just pray this prayer and just kind of repeat it along with Clayton. 
with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, just in your heart, if you want to be reconciled to God tonight, because you saw God living through this kid and you want it. And Clayton, can you lead him in a prayer? Yeah. All right. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. And I am so unworthy. And I believe that you and your word are the truth. And I believe that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and that he rose three days later to be with you. Lord, please take over my life, my soul, and my heart, and my strength. Because I know and I believe that I cannot live this life on my own. I thank you again, Lord. And I love you so much. Amen.